So I'd like to introduce the panelists for the next panel. To my right uh, is Mark Weisbrot, who is the co-director of the Centre for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, to my left is Helen Ginsberg, who is Professor Emeritus of Economics at Brooklyn College, uh, City University of New York, and is also the co-founder of the National Jobs for All Coalition here in the United States. Um, and then just to my immediate right, uh, we have Rene Antonopoulos, who is a Senior Scholar and Director of the Gender Equality and the Economy Program at the Levy Economics Institute of Art College. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, George Sithakis, but unfortunately, uh, along with other members of the delegation there, detained in Canada and having troubles getting a visa. So unfortunately, he won't be here, but we've got Mr. Uh, Pelios here to continue to uh, articulate this recent position on behalf of uh, the delegation. So, so, taking a look now away from the, the kind of macro level down to a more national focus and look at domestic economic programs for growth. Um, I'd like to introduce Mr. Milios to uh, just give a broad overview of uh, Syriza's plans and economic policies. <coughs> First of all, I want to reiterate that um, the root cause of Greece's chronic fiscal problem is low public revenues. The gap from the Eurozone average relative to the GDP was reduced to 4 percentage points in, nine, in 2011, 4.9 and uh, 45.3 respectively. However, they still can't sustain public spending at the level of approximately 50% of the GDP, which has been the Eurozone average over the uh, last years. So, uh, this um, mirrors the, un the unjust ta tax system and the class politics which the ruling elite have followed in Greece uh, for decades, and which became a real problem after the crisis a problem which uh, they want to solve, to resolve, by putting uh, all burden to the shoulders of the working class. So what we say is that we have, a uh, we, we must um, have a change of course, which means that uh, we must stop austerity without uh, rejecting the um, target of uh, fiscal uh, balance, that is of balance, balancing the state budget, but uh, in another way, by other means, by implementing a transparent and just tax system, by uh, putting social needs to the forefront, and so by um, uh, 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 putting forward a, a problem of social and economic uh, uh, restructuring of the country. The public sector is a major problem of the Greek society and economy because it's a, a tool in the hands of the oligarchy in Greece. That is a tool which um, uh, ensures the continuation of this policy, of, of these policies, and even the uh, things with, which, according to these policies themselves, are not legal. For example, tax evasion, and you you know all these stories about the lists of people who were um, um, uh, keeping money in, uh, uh, in abroad while at the same time they declared um, uh, incomes of uh, a few thousand euros per year, while they kept uh, uh, deposits of hundreds of millions abroad, and they were never taxed, and that uh, the political leadership of this country um, uh, knew the data and kept them secret. So we say that we have, uh, we need 
a very drastic reform of the state, in the, but in this direction, not in the direction of uh, uh, promoting austerity and putting forward cuts to wages of the civil servants. Our uh, plan has uh, therefore three major pillars. First of all, to stop austerity, then to reform the state, and then to renegotiate the debt uh, with our European partners. It has become common nowadays, even among the major institutions, but also it's uh, an idea that the IMF uh, uh, recently has put forward that the Greek public debt is not viable. Uh, there are only three ways to reduce the debt. The one is inflation, the second one is growth, uh, uh, that is growth rates that are much higher than the interest rate paid for the debt, and the third way is a haircut of the debt. Uh, it is sure that in the present conjuncture we are not going to achieve the first two uh, uh, ways of uh, <coughs> dealing with the debt problem, so the only way is the uh, drastic haircut of it in order to have a new a restart of the economy and, the, and a new um, situation in society, but this can be achieved only if um, we have a, a change of course which puts burden to the um, uh, wealthy uh, households, which means to the um, to big capital and uh, the rentier uh, strata of the Greek society, which uh, have earned uh, a lot without contributing to uh, the state revenues. Um, these are the th the three directions of our program, and I can be uh, more specific if um, uh, during the discussion, uh, m but now I, w I wanted to raise only one point concerning the debt. What we propose to the European Union draws from something that has happened in, uh, in Europe in the first decade after the First World War, and had as its main actor Germany itself. That is, the restructuring of the non-viable German debt uh, after the London summit in the year 1953. The debt of Germany was not viable. It was restructured. Uh, they agreed on a haircut of uh, 63%, but not only this they also connected the repayment of the rest of the debt with the growth clause. This uh, uh, issue of the growth clause is something very important to us, and this is our proposition to the European Union and all the debtors, because otherwise the Greek debt becomes a pot of Danaidon, that is, a barrel without bottom, where they themselves will throw money in it without gaining anything because the denominator of the ratio uh, debt over GDP uh, 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 is being constantly reduced and so the debt um, ratio increases. Uh, this is a major point in our policy, it's internal policy, but it has uh, necessarily to do also with the European Union and so we say uh, we stop the, 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 the austerity, that is, we annul what is um, um, called in Greece the memorandum, because it's this conditionality that in order to have the loans you have to follow the austerity. We say we are going to achieve a balanced budget and primary surpluses with another method. And second, uh, we put uh, forward this idea of a European summit on the debt problem. Uh, not only the, starting from the Greek debt, which uh, also will be combined with this uh, uh, growth uh, clause idea, 
uh, it has to be a summit or a procedure which will tackle the debt problem all over Europe because, as you know, we have not only the Greek case of uh, uh, sovereign debt, but also the Portuguese, the Irish, the um, Spanish in a, a certain way and so on. Um, so I'd like to ask um, Ms. Antonopoulos if she has a response, and then we'll go around to the other panelists as well. Um, thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. I am honored, in fact, to be here um, together with a series of delegation and all the colleagues uh, that are participating today. Um, let me get straight to the point. I want to bring up an issue um, that um, was uh, discussed earlier, was touched upon earlier, and that is uh, unemployment. Unemployment in Greece today. So far, we have talked about <coughs> the wrong diagnosis about the Greek crisis, the wrong medicine, that is being proposed, that is slowly but firmly killing the patient. So we have heard from the series of delegation their plan to reverse that. And I think that um, there are many voices, many progressive economists, and now we heard even the IMF acknowledging that there is something terribly wrong with the prescription. Um, when it comes, though, to what has happened in Greece, I want to reiterate that a unique conditionality among countries that have been subjected to austerity plans before has taken place, and that is the frontal attack on labor. Wages have been reduced drastically, the collective bargaining processes that have been in place in Greece have not only been called into question, they have changed. And those voices that resisted it were kicked out of their parties, they were kicked out of the parliament, they were kicked out. What we have ended up today is unemployment, which means the quantity of jobs has been reduced, but also the quality of the jobs that exist today has deteriorated immensely. Now, these have been legislated, actually. They have been voted upon. And if, we, if I think about Greece today, what comes to my mind is that there is an extraordinary focus on one type of deficit the country is facing, and not on the huge job deficit that is the result. It is the culmination of the wrong policies. Okay, so from 7.5% in 2008, we are today close to 27%, going to 30%. Unemployment among youth is about 56%, the highest percent in Europe. And women patently have a higher unemployment rate. So this is the terrain. Now, what we know from other crises is that even in the event that a miracle happens and growth picks up, there will be a delay of anywhere between three to seven years for unemployment rates to start coming down. Today, there is a problem. And that problem has the face of suicides, homelessness, devastation, emotional breakup of families. It's a huge, huge problem that confronts the country. So what has been proposed and what has happened on that front in Greece? I am aware of two initiatives. It goes without saying that the first thing that has to take place is the austerity measures have to be removed. Stability of the financial sector and the restructuring of debt indeed has to take place, otherwise the engine cannot restart. But right now, two 
two initiatives uh, that I'm aware of that address the here and now, the short-term and medium-term problem, are as follows. One is the direct social service job creation. It started a few years back. It was introduced by Luca Cazzelli, who was then the Minister of Labor. And what is unique about this program is that it identifies the correct problem in the labor markets today, which is firms, small and medium-sized enterprises, have closed down, and they continue to close down. So what is the problem? The problem is one where there is no demand for the existing labor. The program that was introduced was very small. It was for 55,000 people when the number of the unemployed at that time were about 700,000. Does it have some problems? Yes, it is learning by doing. Recently, while I was in Greece, because I keep going back and forth, I am working actually there, it was announced by the current government that an action plan will be introduced for 350,000 workers. And what is the purpose and the structure of this program? It is to support the employability of the young people and to support their entrepreneurial and entrepreneurship capabilities when we have highly employable people that are migrating right now. We have the unemployed that are going back to rural areas collecting wood because there is no money and income to have a source that you can use for heating and for cooking. So, once again, when it comes to the labor front and how to address unemployment, Although the problem is one of demand of labor, the government is proposing measures to improve the supply of labor. It is wrong diagnosis, it is the wrong medicine once again. Now, let me conclude with a question. Let me conclude with a question. Um, I wanted to find out if um, the Syriza economic team um, has thought about the possibility and the option of scaling up a program that would be along the lines of Kinoniki Ergasia, a program that is public service job creation, and I can describe this for the audience here as very, very similar to the New Deal program that took place in this country in 1930s, during the Great Recession. If such an idea was to gain ground, that would imply that the European leaders need to be engaged and they need to become aware that the Barroso Plan of 2011, 2011 that is proposing as the main program and the main agenda of the whole European Union for all countries, including the countries in crisis right now, will be proceeding with this increase the employability of those that, by the way, have skills. They are highly educated. Um, it would be really um, very important, in my opinion, if um, it is possible to uh, let us know what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. So I think that's a good lady I'm going to ask. Uh, Professor Ginsburg, if she would be able to provide any uh, comments or response, uh, not to Mr. Milios, but also to that proposal and from your own research and experience in the United States working for direct job creation programs and, and, and researching development in, in Sweden program as well. Yeah, first I want to say, not only am I commenting on uh, Greece possible policy, but we're not doing great in the United States with 8%, nearly 8% uh, officially unemployed, more than 12 million people, and you could approximately double that to get an indication of the real unemployment. Um, and I'm, if it's 
talk about, and I preface my remarks by saying I'm in agreement with Matt Forstadter, um, although I present a very keen historical view of both the United States and Sweden, uh, I do not really believe that these can be accomplished under the present rules of the uh, EU. I, I mean, I just, the Maastricht Treaty has absolutely nothing to say about unemployment. In other words, there are limits for debt, for inflation, mm -hmm. for everything else, but unemployment has no, it's, it's, it's a nothing in there. And so let's say this is wishful thinking or thinking, rethinking of uh, the New Deal. When I hear 25% unemployment in Greece, I mean, that's, that's a disaster. I mean, that's a human disaster. It's a waste. It's throwing people away. It's throwing resources away. It's throwing away what you could be doing. It's divisive in a society. You can't have a society really um, cohesive with that kind of situation. But in the United States during the Depression, when Roosevelt came in uh, with the New Deal, unemployment was 25%. And the key, not the only, I mean, the New Deal had a lot of things. So I'm just focusing on job creation as a focus of the New Deal from which we can learn a lot. I'm not saying we copy exactly, because I don't think these are different times, different problems, but to give some examples of what could be done you had, with the first program, the CWA, Civil Works Administration, uh, four million jobs created in a period of a few months. And these were not make work jobs, which was always charged against um, jobs programs and they always will be by conservatives. Um, they did a staggering amount of work. Uh, the WPA, Works Progress Administration, was a very large program. Um, more than three million people um, average. It did not provide jobs for all the unemployed. It never did. It couldn't politically because there, even in the New Deal times, remember this was an era when we were regularly lynching blacks in the United States, and Roosevelt couldn't even get, you know, didn't even bother with that issue. So the staggering number of jobs also reflects a diversity of jobs, a huge amount of construction, schools, parks, playgrounds, airports, LaGuardia Field, I mean, all over the country, okay? Of course, we know that World War II ended the Depression. But if, draw, if, if the New Deal had been politically allowed to continue um, without the political obstacles and had spent it on domestic programs, we would have, you know, achieved full employment without the use of uh, war. I'm not saying that we entered World War II to, to uh, end unemployment, but we do know that during the post-war years, the military budget was built up as a kind of 
job provision, um, which I think we could live without. Okay. Uh, Can I just ask one last question? Can you talk a little bit about Sweden's program and its experience? Yeah. Sweden, Sweden uh, of course, had a social democratic tradition. Um, however, the Swedish social democrats um, in the 1920s, when in some years unemployment among the um, trade union members, that's the only statistics that we have for those years, uh, was more than 25%, okay? But the, even the, some people in the Social Democratic Party uh, believe that if you had public job creation, uh, it should pay low wages because they would say they fit in right now with the whole thinking of the OECD and all the lower wages. Uh, that creates jobs. It doesn't. It destroys jobs. Okay. Uh, when the Social Democrats overthrew that philosophy uh, in the 1930s and overthrew the idea that you need to balance budgets, and they did that officially in 1937 when they headed the government, uh, they had a rapid exit from depression, okay, much, much faster than most other countries. And after World War II, the Swedes, led by the socialist-oriented trade union movement and the Social Democratic Party, um, had <coughs> social democratic government, and Sweden embarked on the idea that they wanted and could achieve a full employment society. And in fact, they were very successful. They were very successful uh, in that during most of this era, from the 19, end of the 19th, well, middle of the 1940s till the beginning of the 1990s, um, unemployment in Sweden, same way we measure it here pretty much, um, was mostly 2% or even less, and a 3.5% unemployment rate could and did topple governments, okay? Um, they had program which helped them build their well-known welfare state. They looked upon full employment not as a cost, but as a necessary benefit. In other words, to fund this. People working are producing and it helped to do a lot of other things uh, in that country until they really officially uh, made full employment not the key priority as they were preparing to join the European Union. Thank you. Uh, now, Mark, if I could ask you a response. Sure. Thanks. Well, it's great. It's an honor to be here with this recent party, which is fighting a, a heroic battle against uh, really, I guess I would call them almost insane uh, policies. I think of the worst extremists here in the uh, in the House of Representatives, and uh, probably they wouldn't even try to implement something that's being implemented not only in Greece but in Spain as well. And so uh, that it's it's really shocking when you compare it to the United States. Um, you know, even if Romney had been elected, he wouldn't have tried anything even noticeable in terms of austerity here. I mean, he would have maybe he would have tried to lower the tax burden on the rich, 
but when they, they don't commit political suicide here like they do. I mean, you lost 12, 14 governments already in Europe. And uh, so this shows what's, what is one way of seeing what's completely structurally wrong here, uh, is that the policy making is completely divorced from any kind of democratic accountability, and people have already talked about it. But I want to go to the, in just my four minutes, I want to give a, a brief look at the idea of, of exiting uh, the euro, not because I'm going to recommend it, because I, I can't do that. I, it's not my thing. It's not my standing to do that. But I think the economics of it is still an important thing to be able to consider, because it's not being uh, discussed in an honest manner. For example, if we look at the Argentine example, that's, that's totally misunderstood. If you ask anybody what happened there, they'll say, well, yeah, they devalued their currency, and then they got a big boost from exports and commodities. That's not true at all, actually. Uh, they got very little from export. It was not an export-led growth experience at all, let alone commodities. About 12% of their growth from the, in the recovery uh, from uh, 2002 to 2010, uh, or, or 2008 if you want to go before the recession, it doesn't matter, it's the same. It's basically, uh, that's what was export. Not 12 percentage points of GDP, just 12 percent of all the, all the growth, and a small fraction of that was actually commodity export. It was led, they recovered because they changed their macroeconomic policies. It was domestic consumption and investment that led the, uh, you know, led the recovery. That's the problem in Greece and Spain and Portugal. They can't control any of their basic macroeconomic policies, uh, fiscal, monetary, or exchange rate, okay? And so that's the first thing that's not understood, and that that, because that's very relevant. And by the way, you know, you don't have to just look at the Argentines, but look at all the worst, look at the worst disasters of the last 20 years in terms of devaluation. Look at Indonesia and Malaysia and South Korea and Thailand during the Asian crisis. Nobody looks like Greece three years after the devaluation. Nobody. They took hard losses, but they recovered fast. And in fact, uh, Arvind Subramanian, he's a, a former IMF economist who now can say things that he didn't say when he was at the fund. He said, he wrote a piece in the Financial Times saying the things that the European, author the thing that the European authorities are most worried about in terms of a Greek exit is that they would recover so quickly that everybody else would want to get out. Uh, and I, I think that is, you know, it's, it's, that, yeah, I, I don't want to say that I'm arguing for this because it is a political decision. You know, I know a little more about Spain, for example, and there I can see it. I mean, when I was there, you know, it's not on the table because it, for political reasons it's not on the table. In other words, people realize, a lot of people, and of course there's big class divisions. If you ask the unemployed and workers, you know, they're more likely, they're much more willing to consider it. But nonetheless, you know, among the people who have a job, which is still, you know, three quarters of the country, uh, you know, they're thinking, they see the euro and, and I think this is true generally among, especially, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, uh, especially in countries that had dictatorships for a good part of the post-war period, the euro is part of that uh, project of democracy. And uh, they're, in Spain, they definitely don't, they're, they're going to pay a big price to leave, uh, to stay there. And they know it, a lot of people. Again, I'm not going to say everybody because, like here, you know, the upper classes and the middle classes too, to a lesser extent, have, a, you know, more of the upper middle classes, have more of a say in, in the politics. And so they, so, so the question of leaving the euro doesn't come up in Spain, even though I think that uh, as a matter of just pure economics, they would be much better off as well if they, if they left the euro. Now you look at Greece, you know, it gets harder, you know, as you go on. The IMF, just uh, released their latest paper and interviews, and they're saying, you know, you've already cut 9% of GDP out of the uh, um, uh, deficit, uh, and there's another uh, six percentage points to go. Economy shrank 6% this year, it's going to shrink another four and a quarter next year. There's, you know, they had to lower their projections by seven percentage points of GDP in just two years, most of that within a five month period. Now they say, okay, now we're going to get it right, but it could still be a lot worse because they are still going in the same 
uh, direction. So we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how long it's going to drag out. And I'm just looking at an income and employment term, you know, not the social cost and, the, and everything else that you were talking about. You know, that's the question, is how long? And it, I, I think it is really difficult, because the longer you go on, the more possibility, because at some point this is going to turn around, okay? If you look at the Eurozone as a whole, I mean, even these most stubborn European authorities, the European Central Bank, which makes Bernanke, who's a Republican, look like a socialist, a <laughs> left socialist compared to that, okay? They have moved over the last two years, you know? They keep moving. They keep doing things each few months that they said a few months ago they were never going to do. And uh, so, again, that's the struggle I think that Sarisa, if I had to, that's what they're battling now and everybody else too. Push them, force them to uh, not go in the same direction that they're going, to let up on the austerity. The IMF is already acknowledging that there goes, has to be a lot more haircut uh, on the debt. So, uh, but the IMF is the junior partner in the Troika, so we don't know still how much you know that means. But it's that there's a direction there, but it's very, very slow. And you know, as of projections now, it takes more than a decade for Greece to get uh, back to its pre-crisis level of income, you know, and probably longer. Argentina took three years. Okay, they have, took a hard hit after the after the uh, default and devaluation. But it was only for three months, okay? And if you look at all these other crises, you know, if you think about it, Greece doesn't change its economy if it leaves the euro. It, you know, the, all the productive capacity is still there. There are hedge funds and investors that are going to come back as soon as they see light. And in fact, that's what happened in Argentina. You know, not it wasn't the exports so much that boosted it. It was the billions of dollars that came back into the country because everything was cheap and the economy was growing again because they changed their policy. So there is another route. I just want to put that on the table and say, you know, uh, and ask also, how is that being discussed in Greece? Because I can't really tell from the media that I have access to. Thank you. So before I hand off to Mr. Miller, I've just got a couple of things. One is, I think, to bring in um, something from the previous panel, this idea of sort of more innovative structural solutions within the current EU um, design, because you know we heard a lot about job creation. My first question would be just sort of how much is that a focus of the economic plan, a direct job creation program? The second thing is, even if you have a haircut, uh, are you looking for investment to come in with the promise of some type of you know profit being then taken back out from the to the you know, European Investment Fund or, or to private investors coming from outside the country? Um, and if not, is there some way of retaining the types of structural deficits that in, in the New Deal era that allowed that type of spending or, or in, in Sweden? Um, and if there isn't, what is the innovative sort of structural solution within a Eurozone system that, that allows Greece to stay in? That would be kind of my two cents of that. So. Okay. <coughs> okay, first of all, I would like to thank you for your comments. And um, I want to say to Rania Antonopoulos that um, I fully agree with the way um, she put things. If we wa want to learn from you and not only from you, also from uh, uh, progressive um, scientists and institutes in Europe and all over the world. Um, institutions like the um, Levy Economic Institute here in the United States and uh, others uh, play a very important role in creating a, an international climate which can change things and want to, to have expertise from all these sides. I find, uh, we find the, the idea of programs of social work or public service uh, job creation uh, very um, um, good for promoting, for changing the situation, of course. And we have, uh, we study them, 
And in our economic committee, we have certain subcommittees which work in this way. For example, uh, there is an initiative in, North, in northern Greece which was actually initiated from um, jobless scientists and engineers and who created an idea that um, uh, idle uh, public property, that is closed factories and other uh, uh, assets, could be used in order to, to, to start a project in this direction. So we study uh, foreign and other experience, and we want to experiment, to, to experiment ourselves in this direction, and I fully agree also with you that um, the European Union uh, was default from its very beginning because it didn't incorporate the, uh, uh, the, the issue of full employment and job creation in the structural elements of, it, or of its uh, whole edifice. Um, I used to belong for several years before the crisis in a circle of uh, European economists call, uh, called uh, European Economists for an Alternative Economic oh. Policy in Europe. Mm -hmm. And our uh, project uh, had the title Full Employment in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we were stressing exactly this question. And this is a, a very, very important problem which has to uh, be seen uh, as um, uh, something that belongs to the very heart of the reforms that shall be taking place in Europe. Um, well, uh, what uh, Professor Mark Weisbrot, uh, Weisbrot said, um, I agree and I disagree. First of all, I, I agree, if I understood well, that it is a, pro a, a matter of changing the microeconomic policies and the microeconomic directions and not a technical uh, problem which can be tackled by a, a rather magical way by changing the, um, um, uh, the, the exchange rate of the currency. You said that uh, the way the Argentinians uh, uh, recovered their economy was not the devaluation and, and, and some uh, export uh, uh, driven growth but the fact that they changed course uh, in this direction I have to ask to, 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 to say by reinforcing and uh, um, um, by reinforcing the, what, what uh, Rania already said, uh, two things. First, uh, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland are small economies, that is, they are price takers. Open small economies, they are price takers. Besides to this, Greece has a very severe problem of uh, uh, an oligopolistic structure of the market, which is a very big problem. And third, uh, as Raina said, this is the case especially for Greece. Uh, its economy is based on small and medium-sized uh, enterprises which uh, produce for uh, the domestic market. So if you destroy the domestic demand, you cannot expect a way out of the crisis. And, and of course, you cannot uh, expect uh, uh, to... you cannot be... In, in any position to contain unemployment. Um, coming now to the question of the, um, uh, of the currency and so on, the actual question is how and if we can change course. This is uh, how I understand the question, how long is it going to take? Of course, we cannot know how long it, will go, it is going to take, but we are confident that with the change of government in Greece and in other uh, 
parts of Europe. And I want to remind you that a few months ago, we were a party of 4.5%. And now, uh, according to the, uh, to the um, uh, polls, uh, we are a party of 30% and uh, probably the first uh, political force in the country. And <laughs> in Greece, this is my point, what happened in Greece is very likely to happen all over Europe and we uh, strongly believe that if we make that change we will um, accelerate things, we will uh, um, uh, put forward a change of paradigm or a, a, a change of model because now if, we th if someone speaks about the European social model the European social model, which uh, a few years ago um, was, was a label to show something more cohesive than the United States, and of course developed Asia, Korea, Japan, and so on. If one says now the European social model, it sounds like a joke, and it is a joke after three years of austerity, after those programs which spread from, uh, from the south to the north. It is really a joke. And this is what we have to change, and we think that we have a common struggle with the working classes and the majority of the people, the middle classes included, all over Europe. So the real question is a redistribution of wealth to the uh, favor of the majority, the question when, uh, first of all, we believe when uh, we, are, we will be able to uh, control government and to change uh, things through our problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I would just like to open up uh, to Raya if she has any other uh, comments or questions or response, and then we'll go around to everybody else and then have one last set of comments. And then we'll have a few minutes at the very end um, for Mr. Cypress to give some last answers to some questions from the audience. Um, it is not uh, popular in uh, my country to speak about Argentina, but I do want to go back to this question of Argentina. Um, they did a radical restructuring of the debt. They said we will stop paying for a while. Okay, and that was step one. But the real transformation, this can be accomplished in different ways. One need not go through a complete default. The suggestion we heard earlier on general repayment uh, schedule in the 50s is an excellent example. You tie repayments and interest rates to growth, period. And that is achievable. But I want to go back to the fundamental change that took place in Argentina. They went from a system of production that had a particular structure. They had agriculture, they had husbandry, they had industry. What they did fundamentally different is that they forced, literally, the system to go away from an investment-led path of development into a wage-led development path. They forced it. It is crazy, but what they did was they said to the labor unions, we are going to be increasing wages at 2% more than the growth rate of the country. We are going to implement, they implemented a program similar to what we were discussing before, the uh, program for heads of households, they called it, Hefesi Hefas de Hogar, and they expected 300,000 participants and 2 million people showed up that were employed for three years through this program. So what they did was they shifted income and therefore resources away from other uses into wages which then stimulated investment. This is classical Keynesian ideas, but it is targeted. It is not your usual Keynesian counter-cyclical policy. It is targeted. And why is it important from a progressive perspective to think seriously about this? Because it accomplishes income, redistribution, 
and functional redistribution on the spot by mandate. Here is the pie. Instead of having 70% of it go into profits, hoping that they may reinvest it in the country and not go through offshores, what they do is they say 70% will go to wages, wages will demand goods, and it is the obligation of the state now to reorient the economy so that production will be covering domestic needs. Another crazy thing that they did was to impose taxes on exports, not on imports. So that if you're producing meat, it was more profitable for the companies to produce it and sell it domestically instead of exporting it. So it is coordination of a set of measures that puts the standard of living and the well-being of society at the center through social justice in mind without eliminating private initiative, small, medium, even large sector enterprises, but disciplining and putting rules down that are fair. And I think this is really the path out of the current austerity. It is a lot more important than switching away from the euro or other ideas that exist that are options, but I think this is really a fundamental piece of the puzzle. Any last thoughts, um, Ginsburg, perhaps relating to political struggles that you experienced trying to push forward a similar full employment policy in the US in the 70s? I don't know if it's relevant. Well, yeah. Um, I could say that the several reasons why we have been unsuccessful in the United States for um, achieving full employment because basically it isn't a goal. Sweden, it was a primary goal articulated that way. Uh, our society increasingly has become extremely individualistic, which I think works against the I, I think you need a sense of solidarity. I, I, we need political power, people who want it, and that's the number one. But I don't think you get it without building a sense of solidarity, because what happens in history um, after World War II, when there was attempts to get full employment legislation, um, because people didn't want to go back to the Depression. But we, we didn't have the power and we had a lot more organizations and groups that supported legislation. Um, similarly, in the 1970s, we actually got a law, which is a well-kept secret. This is a law in the United States. I'm in a law school, so lawyers tell me, what do we do about a law which was in effect, emasculated before it was even passed. It was passed, it had wording in it that every American has the right to a job, you know, but no... This is the Humphrey, Humphrey Hawkins. Yes. <laughs> and I think one more thing about that Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Act of 1978 is that full employment has to be in terms politically we have to build a movement which talks of everybody because otherwise what happens is that people are against unemployment but when they get reemployed that's the end of the depression or the recession. And so it's no longer a problem when they fall out of uh, being in opposition, you know, or wanting the law. 
or wanting public policy in that way. And nobody talks about it, even people on the web uh, don't talk about that issue. It's somewhat like the health issue where uh, you've had to work against the fact that a lot of people had or still have um, coverage which in fact, you know, is pretty decent. And for those people, you know, politically, uh, they were not considered people who were going to support a real universal uh, health care law. Yeah, I'm glad that you know, Raina uh, mentioned the uh, Running, sorry, the, um, some of the social programs in Argentina, they also have a universal allocation for a child, which is uh, one of the biggest conditional cash transfers. And they, they, they succeeded in reducing both poverty and extreme poverty by more than 70% in, uh, de in the last decade. And uh, so these things are possible. Now, I just want to say one or two quick things about why I think Greece is actually in a much better position than Argentina was. To, uh, to go through uh, this kind of a default and devaluation and exit. And uh, first, uh, Greece actually has twice the level of exports uh, as a percent of GDP that Argentina had. So it would get a bigger boost uh, from, from that uh, part of it, just from the devaluation itself. Secondly, the world has changed a lot uh, in 10 years. You know, Argentina had to face down the IMF, uh, which was threatening the worst possible punishments you could imagine, and trying to squeeze them more for the creditors. And they didn't have anywhere to go for money either. Finally, you know, Venezuela gave them some after a couple of years. But, you know, there are a lot more sources of, of borrowing in the world today. You know, uh, China just in the last couple of years alone, Venezuela, $36 billion. Um, Thirdly, uh, there's, um, you know, Greece is a much more developed country, has three times the per capita income that Argentina had at this time, more developed banking system. You know, if you look at financial crises, they're, they're definitely less uh, devastating in countries that are more developed and less uh, developed. I'm talking about the shock that the country would go through, you know, in order to make this uh, transition. And just uh, one more thing, uh, if I can. Um, they, uh, they wouldn't have to, uh, you know, there were a couple IMF economists who said, I remember Simon Johnson, I was on a TV show with him, he said, well, you know, Greece can't get out now because they don't have a, even a, a, a primary balance, so they can't even pay, you know, their, uh, uh, meet their budget. And it's a weak argument anyway, but uh, if you look at the latest IMF data uh, from this month, uh, for this year, uh, Greece is projected to have a primary balance of, without interest of zero, which means if they weren't paying interest, they got their budget covered, okay? Current account deficit is, a, even, to me, the most important one. That's down to 1.2% of GDP, which means that if Europe uh, decided to try and punish Greece, uh, they would need very little in terms of foreign exchange, uh, euros, dollars, or whatever, in order to uh, go forward. And I don't even think they would dare uh, to, to, to really uh, try and retaliate uh, against them. But if they did, uh, Greece is in a relatively strong position now. That's what happens after several years of, of, of this kind of adjustment. Okay, I'll leave it there. I understand it's very late and people have been uh, heroically staying through it all, so I'm going to thank this panel and see if we can have the last couple of minutes just for a few questions from the audience uh, to Mr. Cypress. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.
So just a couple of questions on the basis of the ones yeah. raised. Or comments. Well, questions and then, ah, okay. and then if you'd like to respond or comments, I can phrase them. Because there are a lot of things that I want to <laughs> comment on. Make comment on that. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll ask some questions and you can make the okay. comments. Um, <laughs> hopefully people can stay a few more minutes. Um, so the, the first one is just, uh, there are a lot of questions in the audience about uh, Syriza's position towards bank nationalisation and the extent to which it considers that uh, within the spectra of options to, to look at and if they would, you know, if other things fail, consider that as a possibility of getting around the conditions imposed by international lenders or the ECB. Um, I think there are ways that they could command national banks to buy Greek debt, for example, at a certain level. Um, the second one is the idea of uh, current state of collective bargaining and the way that uh, it's been decentralized in recent times and what Syriza thinks about the way that the unions are working right now and whether or not they think that the union structure is pre that decentralization is, is working, was working well or what, what their vision for, sorry, the, 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 the union structure, my apologies, the un, union structure in Greece, trade union, trade union, yeah, trade union structure, my apologies, yeah, the trade union structure in Greece. Uh, this is, I'm just going to the questions that people ask, but the, the trade union structure being decentralised and the collective bargaining in that process and whether or not they think it's reasonable uh, support that or, or try to reform it and undo it. And then lastly, uh, just to, to use one person's um, question, we've had uh, two panellists who've been more radical than the radical party. Um, what would you do if you had <laughs> enough power to achieve things and what do you plan on doing if the ideas for European reform don't succeed. If, you, if, if that coalition is not going to be um, it, successful at a European level, what's, is there a, what coalition? No, coalition. A, the coalition of European left oh. parties, is, is there a radical plan within Greece or is the, are these agendas going to be incremental if you were in power? Thank you. Oh, and sorry, one last one. And what would you like to say to the Greek students? <laughs> My apologies. The Greek students here in New York. Okay, first, first of all, let me say some things about uh, some comments about uh, the, the debate that we had before. I want to underline, first of all, that in Greece we, we, we have not only a recession situation, but we are a country, we are a country under depression. We have already after five consecutive years of recession, we have already lost 25% of GDP. And the predictions are that in 2013, in this year, we lost already about 30% of GDP. And now unemployment in Greece is about, the official unemployment is about 26%. And the predictions are that in the current year, the unemployment will be about 30%. And especially in young people, unemployment is about 50%. So one of two young people uh, under 28 years has no job. And the most of them try to find a way to go away from Greece. Sure. And this is the drama, the dramatic situation in Greece. Because it's very difficult to create a, a permanent future, an optimist future for, 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 for the country without the smart brains, because the people that, the young people that they want to leave the country are the more, the, more, the more smart brains. Secondly, so I, I wanted to say that we're under a humanitarian crisis. It's not only a, 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 a crisis, economical crisis, a debt crisis. It's something more than a debt crisis that we live in Greece. So that's why we said that Greece was like a guinea pig all this year yeah. of barbarian, violent policies, neoliberal policies. The second that I wanted to say is that 
there were a lot of differences between Greece and other examples, between Greece and Argentina, for example. Why? Because our national currency is Euro. We don't have a national currency with a balance with Euro, with Dollar, something that happened in Argentina. It's very different. Of course, you could discuss a lot about if it was right or not to be inside the European oh, Union, man. to be inside the Eurozone. But it's different to discuss about the past, what happened in the past, and to discuss if the Grexit is a solution for Greek people now. And I want to assure you that if Greece wasn't a country of Eurozone, a country of Europe, I would not be in front of you now, as you didn't invite the left parties of Romania, that it's a guy that became prime minister. I am here and all the world look about and care about Greece all these years, because Greece is a member of Eurozone. And because Greece was and is a systemic danger for Eurozone. That's why I'm here now. And that's why all this year Syriza was in the care of the people. Because I believe that Eurozone, and we believe that Eurozone is like a chain with 70 links. If one of these links broken, the chain will be damaged. That's why we never believe that it was a real scenario, the scenario of Brexit. It was only a blackmail. A blackmail because they wanted that this scenario would be a, a threat, a tool to push and press Greek people to accept these barbarian measures. Because everybody knows that if Greece goes away from the Euro, we will have we have already uh, 25 uh, points of GDP uh, uh, devaluation, internal devaluation of incomes. We lost 25 points of GDP. If we go away, we will have immediately 30% of GDP. And Greece is not a country like Argentina. Argentina has some uh, thousands of kilometers of fields with soya, uh, some uh, thousands of cows uh, that uh, make uh, uh, food, uh, that make uh, product, products. Greece has already tourism, of course. We have some uh, uh, we product, uh, 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 we product some, uh, we have good, uh, for example, uh, olive, oil. Olive, oil. olive oil, yes, of course. We have tzatziki, souvlaki, something like that. <laughs> But it's not the same. It's not the same with Argentina. Of course, I like very much Argentina. I was in Argentina a month ago, a month ago in December, and we support the efforts that they do because it was very, very, very nice for them. We, we we supported the, the the efforts that they did in Argentina. They tried to be away from the speculating markets and it was very good for us, for everything, and we support their efforts, but it's very different. So, at the same time, we believe that our disadvantage, but also our advantage, is that we are member of the Eurozone. And this is our nuclear weapon. <laughs> yes, because it's like the, the frozen war. Everybody knows that if something like that will happen, a Grexit, for example, or an exit of another country, the next day, the country that uh, will decide to go away from Eurozone, from Euro, will be the German, will be German, Germany. Because, why? Because, of course, its economy is stupid, somebody says in the past. Because the cost <coughs> of a bailout, it will be more... Uh, 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 big than the cost uh, of uh, uh, 
the cost of the bailout will be very bigger than uh, the cost of uh, uh, the re uh, remaining the, 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 the euro. So, what I wanted to say, I wanted to say that we didn't believe the threat of a Brexit. That's our weapon now. We don't believe also now the, 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 the threat of exit. When I was to Mr. Schäuble last two weeks ago, I said to him that we don't understand that this program is it's, 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 uh, it doesn't work. We don't understand that this program of austerity measures is a catastrophic way for everybody. Of course he understands. Of course he understands, but their strategy is to continue with austerity. Because at the same time, the surpluses of North are the deficits of South. And Germans and uh, the speculator, the speculator market, the speculating market at the same time in Europe helps a lot with this situation. They don't care about the social cohesion, they don't care about unemployment, they don't care about democracy, which is the victim of this situation, they don't care about the young people, they care only about their earnings, and they earn a lot. So, <laughs> we think that we, are, we, we, we already well, we, we already are vindicated about our analysis, about for our analysis that this crisis was not a Greek crisis, was not was a European crisis. It's a systemic, structural crisis of Euro, of European Union, and at the same time, of glo global capitalism. And if we're now in the United States, and there is care about Syriza, what they're going to do with Syriza, it's not only because, I said before, our weapon is that we're a member of, European, uh, of Euro, and if we go away, uh, the problem will be the other side, the other field. But at the same time, because it's very difficult in the globalization, in, in the globalization, to, to keep uh, the virus of recession only in one country, <coughs> only in Europe. Because the deep recession in Greece is a systemic problem, and now we can understand that the recession is not only in Greece, the recession is also in Italy, the recession is also in Portugal, in Spain, tomorrow in France. Because Mr. Hollande doesn't uh, manage to change the situation. I don't know if he will be Hollande or that I can <laughs> so, just before. Okay. Um, A couple of questions please. still. The, the three or four. Bank nationalization, trade union structure, and picture of you waiting tomorrow, what happens? Okay. It's, 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 it's a question, but it's difficult to answer this question without saying what, uh, what, what we have now in Greece with the banks. You think that in Greece we have banks. We don't have banks. We have zombies. <laughs> They're not alive. They have, they have already, we have already given to the banks 200 billion euros in the, end, the, the beginning of the crisis. 200 billion euros. So, uh, this, uh, this uh, account, this uh, uh, money, are money that the people, the citizens, have to pay in the future. So what do you mean, nationalize of the banks? <laughs> what do you mean? Is there anybody of them, of the owners of the bank, that have paid only one euro to keep the banks in their own? Nobody. But the same person that they had the banks 
during the years that they earn, they earn, they, 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 they have a lot of, of, of earnings, the same persons are now, even though we have already paid 200 billion euros. So, it's a question with, with a very, very simple answer, I believe. Of course we will nationalize the banks. There is no other way. But I'm not sure if these banks will be banks. <laughs> Maybe, because I said it's not a bank. Maybe we have to create new banks, not this. So the second question was about trade, trade unions. Union deregulation. Yeah. Okay, this is a big problem, I think. So because we have a, a crisis of representation, as you know. Because if we were, if, if we were a, a government in June, maybe it would be the first government in uh, Europe, uh, I don't know ever else, that we will be against austerity, but the trade unions will discuss about austerity. <laughs> because the leadership of trade unions are not so radical, so what can I say? So, it's a different question and it's a different uh, answer. But as, as, as we saw the last, the, last, the last time in Greece, everything changed very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. The political situa situation changed very quickly. We were a party of 40% some months ago. And now we're a party about not 40, but <laughs> close. close to 40. <laughs> so, the last question was about the... If you got in and you had you know, no problems in enacting your reforms, but the European Union and the coalition of the left parties at that level were not, were not able to achieve the, ch the structural reforms of the Eurozone, what happens? Do you just fight within that system, or is there something radical? Sure, I want to say that we are prepared and we are ready for a big fight. We are psychologically ready and prepared for a big fight. I said before that it's something like the frozen war. The, and the cold war. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's funny, but I think uh, it's, it's something like that because everybody understands and knows that if uh, somebody pulls the button, it will be an explosion. If uh, the, our partner decide to go uh, to, to continue without Greece, the next day it will be a, a very different day for Europe and for Eurozone. But even though if we decide to go away, even though I said before that we have a lot of problems because it were different with Argentinians. Of course, Eurozone will be, for Eurozone, for Europe will be a different day. Imagine the investor, the next day of uh, an exit from, of Greece or, 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 or of another country, he will have to calculate the risk of something that happened, of the fact of an exit. So I believe that uh, I believe that as happened in cold and not frozen war, in cold war, that everybody knows that the nuclear uh, uh, weapon is uh, disaster for everybody, and the next day will be a disaster for everybody. If somebody uh, make, uh, don't, if somebody wants to, 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 to do uh, a step uh, forward, he will lose the game. So we don't want to do the step forward. So that's why I said we are prepared to fight and to not do 
the forward step. What it does mean that? It means that we will not change opinion for the memorandum of austerity. If it will be the next government in Greece, we will reject the memorandum of austerity. And this is our right. Because we are about ourselves and we want our people to live, not to survive, to live with dignity. This is our position. Thank you everyone, just another round of applause. Thank you very much and thank you for everyone who's participated in this stage.